Is Robinhood a scam? Should you trust it? Should you invest your money with them? Should you borrow money from Robinhood to invest money and make more money? Or should you do option trading with Robinhood? It's a whole bunch of questions that I have that I wanted to answer for you guys. And I did the research, right? But rather than me coming here and answering it by myself, I actually had Logan come on, right? And this guy, wow, spectacular, right? He has a whole bunch of articles that he's written himself, has a whole bunch of those articles actually featured on some, like one of the biggest media outlets out there, like Bloomberg, and he's done a whole bunch of work on this stuff, okay? So rather than me coming on, I actually had an expert come on with me to actually talk about all these topics. Now, in this entire interview, guys, we don't only really talk about, okay, like, okay, Robin Hood, but we also talk about investments for the future, what's actually going to happen. We talk about taxes. We talk about every single thing that you can possibly need, all right? So I hope you guys enjoy this interview. Thank you for watching. And by the way, if you like Logan and what he says in this video, I have all his information actually linked down below, right? He has his articles, very great, very detailed with good examples, very simple to understand. And on top of that, he has a book written that you can actually buy on Amazon for a very low price. Okay, guys, check it out. Really appreciate this guy, and he's very smart and very intelligent. So watch the interview and let me know down in the comments below what you think about it. All right, guys, so I'm here with Logan, and this is a guy that I actually found when I was actually doing all the research for the Robin Hood stuff. And as you can see, very knowledgeable guy, and I always wanted to bring him on the show, and we finally managed to actually set it up. So we're gonna be talking today about Robin Hood and everything that he actually thinks about it and all the calculations he's actually done. And it's gonna be like basically his show for the day. All right, so go ahead. Logan, do you want to introduce yourself or anything like that? Thanks, Tommy. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, we're, we're going to talk about a little Robin Hood today. Uh, what do y'all want to know? <laughs> all right. So basically, what I want to ask you is like, all right, just give me like a quick summary. Not a quick summary. You can give me like a full like feature length summary of like your entire article and what you thought about it. Like what do you think about the entire thing with Robin Hood? Like what's like your, what don't you like about it? And what do you like about it? Okay. So basically, Robin Hood is an app that lets people trade stocks supposedly for free. And I, I have a column for Seeking Alpha, and I dug through Robinhood's SEC filings, and I was the first person to really publicize that they were the amount of money that they were making from selling their customers' orders to high-frequency traders. Um, you know, you saw a little discussion on Twitter and Reddit about it before, but I was the first person in the media to actually publicize it. Yeah. The article blew up. Um, you know, you had Robinhood saying all kinds of stuff. And, you know, you know, the, like different different news outlets treated it differently. Like Bloomberg picked up the story, Wall Street Journal picked up the story, and they were more measured. And then you had other places like Zero Hedge, just like spewing conspiracy theories about Robin Hood. Um, honestly, what I would tell people about Robin Hood is it's not the worst thing in the world, but it's not the best either. They really advertise Robin Hood as being free, but it's not free. Um, I think. I, I would love to know what percentage of Robinhood customers make money. I don't. I, I do not think it's anywhere close to fifty percent. Yeah, I would say probably eighty plus percent of Robinhood customers lose money, and of Robinhood customers who trade options, I would say over ninety five percent lose money. Over ninety five percent. That's a that's that's well, a big estimate. Because Tommy, they'll never give us the data, but it's pretty common for it's pretty common for brokerages to like have most of their retail customers lose money. And for me, like, for example, whenever I make videos, I tell people, like, you know, picking stocks is, like, super, like, hard to do. You know, like, you need to know, like, all the analytics, all the calculations, intrinsic values, and all these things. And then you have people that go in there, just think, like, they're going to make money, get a referral link, get, like, five bucks stock, and then they're good to go. People that are trading options because they see a whole bunch of people on YouTube, like, making thousands of dollars, but in reality, it's not that easy. And I, listen, man, I think those, like the estimates are very conservative. I don't even think it's like like that high. Okay, maybe now because like the market is like going like up so high, but like eventually like people picking stocks like there's not gonna be successful. And it's like statistics actually back that up. Same thing that Warren Buffett says. I mean, you know, Buffett he's a stock picker himself. Um, yeah. Just uh, the, the problem is people have no edge. So like if you're you're just getting a Robinhood account and you're just slinging the stocks, so you're paying transaction costs every time you buy and sell. And not only that, but I mean, these high-frequency traders are paying for the privilege to trade against you. I mean, it is there is a variety of biases that cause people to lose money. So, I mean, for the average guy, you, you're exactly right, Tommy. I mean, Vanguard. And you can actually you can get a Vanguard account. You can invest in ETFs, commission-free, yep. and you can grow your money. And I think Robinhood is entertainment. I think people need to recognize that. Um, and it just, it, it, if people want to do Robin Hood, they just need to recognize that they're probably not going to win unless they have some sort of systematic process 
the yeah. during their trades. They're just they're not gonna win. It's like that advertising yes. their product like for like for everyone, but not letting everyone know like, hey, if you pick stocks, if you don't have any expertise, the likely chance of you actually making any money is like very low. And while you're trading, we're still gonna make money, but you're probably not gonna make any money. Yeah, and that's that's the basic business model for stock brokerages since I don't know two thousand years ago, and they were probably trading stocks in Rome or something. I don't know if they had stocks then, but like <laughs> this has been going on forever, <laughs> probably. What so what do you Logan, what do you think what do you think like this is gonna lead to like for example this entire like like free no trade stocks like do you think like e trade and all the other like funds are actually gonna pick this up because they're still gonna make a ton of money but not as much money like do they still do need to stay competitive and stuff like that you, you know so if you actually look at their SEC filings Tommy uh, e trade TD Ameritrade they make most of their money off of margin interest not off of commissions really? um, so their biggest profit driver is people who buy stocks on margin, and you can look, I mean, billions and billions of dollars of people who do this. You want to explain what that is so, like, the average person can actually understand what you mean by that, like, buying margins and stuff like that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, basically, on E-Trade, like, if you want to, and Robinhood does this, too, at a slightly yep. less crappy interest rate. Um, so, like, with E-Trade, if you deposit $10,000, right, you can buy $20,000 in stocks. So ten thousand is your money, and your broker will lend you another ten thousand, but they'll charge you interest on the second ten thousand. So yeah. right now, I think for E Trade, maybe it's eleven percent interest. And we're 11%. talking interest rates. Uh, yeah, and it's, it's guaranteed for them, and they they have your stocks as collateral. So if at any point that loan is threatened, they sell your stocks and they pocket the money. It's yeah. not a good. And then the Robinhood margins, like I think for every like like it doesn't matter how much money you have in there, I think you can, like borrow like against like fifty percent, right? And then they give it to you like for five percent. It was a five percent or eight percent. I think Robinhood is five or six percent interest. I think five five comes to mind, but you you'll have to fact check me on that. So I mean, with Robinhood, I think it depends on how much money you borrow. Um, but yeah, they they charge interest to buy stocks, and it's guaranteed for them, and it's not guaranteed for you. Do you think it's ever a good idea to to? To buy, to like borrow money to buy investments. Yeah, like hedge funds do it all the time, but they borrow at the LIBOR. They don't borrow at nine percent. It's a big difference in paying yeah. two versus paying nine. And to, today, I found out that um, this is a completely different thing. But today, I found out that like for every dollar you put in a bank, they can like lend like up to ten dollars in debt. Do you know that? Yeah, yeah, that's the reserve requirement. Like circling right back, like all right. So what do you think is like um? Like a better um solution, like for like um the average investor, then, like rather than using like Robinhood or, oh, that, or should they keep using Robinhood because it's still like you know like they're passing basically on Robinhood is making the money off of your losses, but you're not really like losing any money in in a way, right? I mean, how how are you not losing money? If you're I mean, like money? all right, so for example, right, if I if I because when I used to trade stocks, right, I used to buy stocks and stuff like that. I did like all the research. I made sure like what I was buying was actually an actual investment. Rather than just speculating, right? That's different. And then rather than buying it through E-Trade, I would buy it like through Robinhood because I can save on the on those little fees, like ten dollars when you buy, ten dollars when you sell, blah blah blah, right? But for the average investor that they're buying, like not really investing, they're just speculating when they're they're just saving money in the fees and either way, like they they're not gonna like they're only gonna lose money like on their investment if they weren't like smart enough to actually calculate everything. But um for like someone that's act, like an actual investor, like should they still use Robinhood because they're saving on those like commissions and in, in any way? Yeah, so it's Robinhood. It it can be useful. Um, so if you are really a small investor and you have a good process, you can you can use Robinhood. Uh, I don't love their order execution. Um, I, I I just think it, high frequency traders can take free shots at you on the order execution, and I've wrote multiple articles about this. Um, your ideal brokerage to use depends on how much money you have. Um, so for the small investor, I would say just Vanguard, like Vanguard, buy ETFs, commission free. Um, they'll, they'll take care of you. They'll look out for you. Robinhood is not looking out for you. And if, if you are really in that category, like you got one to $2,000 and you want to trade stocks and yeah, do Robinhood, but no, no going in that like most people are not making money there and that. If you trade a ton, you're probably not going to win. Um, yeah. It, I mean, it depends. You know, like it's it's very possible to make money trading stocks. Just the, the biases that people have cause them to lose money because they all do the same thing. Does, it, does that make sense? Like, I read a lot about this thing called the disposition effect, Tommy. Um, mm -hmm. it's, it was discovered by Harvard researchers, and basically what they said is people buy high and sell low. That's basically how it works. So if a stock okay. is going, up, yeah. 
Exactly. So just the way stocks behave, it's like if a stock goes up, they sell it right away, book the profit. If it goes down, they hang on to it forever. This is not yeah. good. If you let this happen, slowly your portfolio becomes filled with losers and dogs of stocks. And you already sold yeah. all your winners buy more of your losers. Well, that's not how the market works. Like Winners keep winning and losers usually keep losing. That's one of the main reasons why retail investors lose money. Um, pe people, they really don't understand how skewed the stock market is. So like, you might think that because the average return on the S&P 500 is about 10% per year, that the average stock returns that. The average yeah. stock returns less than 5% per year. And that's the winners, five. they win a lot bigger than you think. Like Apple, like Amazon, like those are winners. And you do not see, I mean, I think since 1983, I think the most common outcome for an individual stock is for it to go to zero. Zero. Like that, that's, that's the mode. Median return for stocks is about, I don't know, it's like four or five percent per year for or across all stocks. I mean, that's, that's less than Robinhood would charge you to buy on margin. But if you pick and you pick well and you hang on to it, you can make a lot of money. Make yeah. sense? Yeah, but the average person isn't gonna isn't you know you know you know how crazy you have to be, and I do this all the time. But you know how crazy you have to be to see like for example, uh, a stock like not like performing that well, but like in in the in the like in the data it says that you know it's a good business and it's gonna go up. But you have to be kind of crazy to even buy stocks when they're losing. You know that's why everybody buys stock like when they're like when they're you know like, when they're coming up. And that's what the average person does. Well, I mean, look at it this way, Tommy. I mean, just, just like let's say you buy Apple, right? Yeah. Like, if you feel like you're worried about Apple, just go to the Apple store. See if it's busy. Exactly. You know, you, you remember with that with that example. You remember when Warren Buffett said, "Um, you know, when I, when people were going like crazy over, I think it was the Bank of America, was it Bank of America? Yeah. And then he was like, you know, when I went to like um the, every every other place, people were still using their cards. It's not gonna go broke. You know what I mean? Yeah. And you know, you know, I mean, traders and investors, you know, these big mutual funds. New York is really the center of the center of of the big money. So they see what happens in New York and they all talk to each other and they all, they all, they heard, they heard like animals. But like, if you actually go to the Apple store and you actually look, you could have done this anytime between the launch of the iPod and now. You would have known that Apple stock is not going to go down in the long run. That's yeah. cool. But like 2008, global financial crisis, Apple goes down, I think over 40%. Yeah. Know? It's not like the Apple stores were empty. I mean, they took a little hit and they recovered just as quickly. But yeah. like that would have been the perfect time to like buy more stock in Apple. Yeah, exactly. And I mean, and honestly, I, I think Apple's still a good buy. I mean, it's 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 a little expensive. Like I would have liked it better in December when it was around one fifty a share. But it's yeah, it's definitely. not that high. When I considered buying Apple, it was like around ninety dollars a share. I was still in college back then. Yeah, which is crazy. You know what? You know what I read about. Uh, you know the nights you're talking about, like the, you know, the average stock is going to zero, and like their return on average maybe like five percent. Like I also read that like sixty years ago, like the companies that were in like in the SP five hundred, like the top five hundred companies, like sixty percent of those companies are like not no longer there. Like they're like completely gone. How do you think that's gonna affect like buying like index funds and stuff like that, like in the future? Like while you're holding and like while those companies are gonna like be like um like going bankrupt or like leaving or like just going out of business or like coming obsolete? I, I actually do have a really good answer for that. Uh, another reason why regular investors fail to beat the S&P 500 is because the S&P 500 is very intelligently designed. Um, so there's two main things to this. The first is quality. So to be included in the S&P 500, you have to make money. Yeah. There's little companies out there that lose money. So if you look at, say, the Russell 3000, right? It's the Russell... That's the 3,000 biggest stocks in America. About a yep. third are losing money at any given time, especially smaller stocks. And, and I don't think anybody would be shocked, and research backs this up, that stocks that lose money, they do worse than stocks that make money. Not right. Yep. Quality yep. outperforms junk. And yep. the, the quicker people start to believe this, the better. And it's 100% true. Secondly, the S&P 500 is market capitalization weighted. What that means is, is it hangs on to the winners and it dumps the losers. So yep, yep. once a stock becomes too small to be in the S&P 500, it gets delisted. So if you fail, you don't stay in the index. And yep. 
it's even bigger. It's an even crazier turnover on the Nasdaq. Like I think the Nasdaq has turned over four times, almost five times since it, since it started. I think it started in 1985. Um, so that it's gone up big over time, but it's different companies. I mean, yeah. at the height of the tech bubble, I mean, Mark Zuckerberg was in high school. Snapchat yeah. didn't exist. Uh, that, Technology is it's so dynamic and it's such you can make so much money from being smart and investing in technology. It's the trick is is it's hard to know which technology to invest in. So yeah. the best way to play it a lot of times is to just buy as much as possible through the Nasdaq, through an index fund. That way you guarantee that you'll get some of the winners. You get some of those stocks that go up a thousand, two thousand, three thousand percent. What do you What do you think about like um, for example, like using like you know, because sometimes you can read like a like an accounting sheet or whatever, or a statement, and it could say like, oh, you like you know, this company is like losing money, but when you take a closer look to it, like they're just using like like tax loops to actually like you know like, like kind of like evade some stuff, but it's still like a good company. Like it'll show up on the balance sheet, um, like if they're and. Well, companies also they also report their globally consolidated earnings. Yeah. So, so the numbers that you see on the earnings are not the numbers that are reported for tax purposes. That's two different concepts. Can you explain that a little bit? Yeah. Yeah. So like companies might report their globally they do report their globally consolidated earnings. So if their US company is losing money and their Cayman Islands subsidy their Cayman Islands and Ireland company is making money. This is Apple, by the way. The company globally is making money. So that's what gets reported to shareholders. Um, and this is very common in technology for profits to accrue offshore. And that's just, that's just how it is. The Trump tax bill changed some of this. But you shouldn't worry as an investor about just just trust that it works behind the scenes. What do you, what do you think about the Trump tax bill? Like all the details. Um, I'm in Texas. We came out really nice off of that. Um, it basically redistributes wealth from New York and California to Texas and Florida. Um, they cut they cut tax rates and then they got rid of deductions that people in New York and California use. Um, and so Trump's gambit here is that he's not going to win those states anyway. So by redistributing wealth to states that he can win, he is it's it's political it's politically brilliant. As far as the effects on the economy, it solved a lot of the problems in the U.S. tax system, but not all of them. Like the corporate tax rate was really high. This this drove stocks up about twenty five percent when yeah. they when he cut the corporate tax rate. So this is a big deal. I mean, the stocks the stocks would be twenty percent lower had they left the corporate tax rate where it was. Yeah. So, I mean, it's kind of mixed. The the effects of the tax bill. I'm I'm in favor of it. Um, they need to they need to do different things. Like they they could honestly do things that would both raise revenue and be more fair. Um, yep. there's, there's a lot of bull in the tax code. Like, like yeah. a- what do you, what do you, Logan? What do you think about? Um, I made a video about this. I got a lot of hate for it. All right. What do you think about? Um, um, Andrew Young, Yang, not Young Yang. What do you think about him? I, I don't know him. Do you don't know? Um, Andrew Yang is a guy that um is running for president. He's Asian and he's offering UBI one thousand dollars for all. The UBI like basic income. Yeah. Universal basic income. You haven't heard about him? No, I, I I've heard of the concept. I haven't heard about him. As far as basic income, I think it's it's inevitable as technology has a greater and greater share of our economy. I mean, we're gonna have a lot of people with nothing to do. So I guess I guess at some point the technology will make the money and we'll just pay people to play video games. I don't know. <laughs> I mean that's that's a little down the road. In my in my in my video what I said was because a lot of people are expecting this one thousand dollars to like change their lives completely. And then when I did research on it, I said, like, you know, like, 69% of Americans don't even have $1,000 in their savings accounts. 34% don't have a savings account. 60 million households have a negative net worth. And I said, well, the money isn't the problem. Money is education, like, the financial background those people have. Because there's another statistic that says, like, well, one in five millionaires in America have, like, a, like a regular nine-to-five job. So what's the difference between those people and the entire rest of America? So my stance was that, this one thousand dollars UBI isn't gonna fix anything whatsoever when it comes to like, cause I think people are gonna, you know, like when for example, right, when people in low income neighborhoods and they have like kids or whatever, they get this like tax return like once every year, and then like a month yeah. later you ask them like, oh, where's the money? And they tell you, well, it's, it's on my wall. I bought a new TV. 
you know? I mean, what is it? It's a thousand a month or a thousand a year? It's a thousand a month, 12,000. And he's thinking about taking that money from like, um, for example, he's saying like, oh, Amazon didn't, you know, like all this like um, fear mongering and like trying to like real, like raw people up. He's saying that he's going to take the money from Amazon, like all the companies out there and trying to make them pay more taxes, blah, blah, blah. And yeah. I mean, Tommy, it's, it's possible. We're, we're probably going to have to double GDP to make this happen. I mean, if we want to have a ton of people not work and get paid, like it'll 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 take 25 years of economic growth to have this happen. And it'd be honestly, it'd be a good thing I mean, if GDP is double what it is now, right? So if we double the amount of the pie, we can afford to give away. We can afford to give away money to everybody because if if machines truly are doing the work, I mean, that's an ideal outcome. I mean, people have more time to play. You know, they have the, the work week might go from. The average work week might go from 40 hours a week to 30 hours a week. Society would be richer. Um, it, it's kind of utopian. It's not It's not feasible right now. I mean, we don't have the money to pay for this right now. I think that's why, that's why there is no basic income right now. The country that would actually be closest to it is probably Norway. Um, they have a ton of oil wealth. So you see yep. this up in Alaska, too. They have the Alaska Permanent Fund. They write checks to everybody who lives in Alaska. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I saw that, too. But my, my main thing is like not really like how is it gonna help like GDP, but I'm talking about like the individual, like the like the average person that's still in debt or whatsoever like that. Like that one thousand dollars is gonna like really like like do what they think is gonna do for them. I mean it's probably it probably will make very little difference in their lives. But the important thing is that it would reduce absolute poverty in the US, which there's still a decent amount of it's, poverty, it's the, really par the poverty it, level like, is like is like fourteen thousand a year, right? I I mean the government the way they define poverty is kind of political. Like what would be considered impoverished in the US would be considered middle class in other countries. Yeah, like, like yeah. But like basic income could do is there are some places in the US that are very down and out. I mean talking Indian reservations like set the Rio Grande Valley in Texas, um, like the Appalachian Mountains out in the country, like there are desperately poor places in the U.S. that we would never see because we live in the cities. And yeah. basic income could be good for them. But like, this is not something that's politically like going to happen within the next 10 years. Yeah, but, but he, the thing is with him, he's pushing for it. Like he's pushing as if it's going to happen like while he's there in term. Like, you know, maybe that's just like a political thing just so you can like get an office or try to get an office. But, um, yeah, what, what do you, what do you think about like, all right, this is like a little theoretical, right? What do you think about like, um, if like, um, you know, like, like from, um, like for example, I don't know, like what's your financial background and stuff like that, but I'm pretty sure like you have one, but if like, since like, um, like most people like in my area, like none of them like know anything about finance. Like, what do you think about like teaching people about finance and about like net worth and about redistributing like wealth, like from the beginning, I think, um, in Singapore, Every single kid that starts like school, like from the beginning, like they're, they're it's mandatory for them to like to have a savings account. So like by the time like they graduate, like they have some money saved up. Like, do you think? The question I'm asking, like, why don't why don't you think like like you know there's nothing like that in schools whatsoever? I don't know. It's kind of messed up. <laughs> they should probably <laughs> teach people how to, how to balance their like how to how to balance their like not checkbooks anymore but debit cards. <laughs> Yeah, but like what? <laughs> every 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 politician is talking about okay taxes. They're talking about this, but like when it comes to like education, it's like it's been the same for so long. Like I I honestly think like if people if like we focus more on education, like everything else was just like you know like step by step like come in, you know, because like the people that they're saying they're gonna lose their jobs with technology, right? Is like these truckers, right? These truckers, a lot of the people that work in factories and a whole bunch of other things. But it's kind of like all right, so. My entire perspective is like by the time you turn forty, like you should be already like financially free. So that you should if you make investments like from the time like you're born or whatever, your parents were like, you know, you know, smart and savvy enough, by the time you turn forty, you should already be financially free. So none of that stuff should even matter. A lot of people do it. They're just not the they're just not the majority. You know, the average person in our society, I mean, they're they're overweight, over medicated, depressed. Um, you know, making very little dead end jobs. Um, you know, education is helpful, but like, I it, the, the problems go deeper than just education. And education would be a really good start, but I mean, ev everybody can have a perfect body if they want to. Everybody yep. can everybody can retire by forty if they want to. The question is, do you have do you have the drive to make that happen? I don't think I don't think it's just drive. I think it's more like yeah. hab habitual also, because I feel I think um more people, 
like people and they, like everything we are is just habits right like you're probably like you probably taught yourself like you know like i, I want to write every single day or something like that and even when i don't feel like writing i'll still write like that's a habit you taught yourself and for me like every time like i want to make a video i just make a video every single day no matter if i feel like doing it or not but like like for that like obesity thing and all that stuff it's kind of like you know if you grew up like in a neighborhood like in my neighborhood like you every everywhere you go like there's someone obese there like you know your neighbors like they're obese they're overweight every single person like around and that's not an exaggeration like almost everyone is like overweight but if like and that's just like a habit you know what i mean so it's like I, that's why i feel like education is like so important i feel like that's like the one solution that we can actually do like if you fix it because everything that we're doing right now is kind of like all right so we'll take We'll take, and I read this today, I think, you know, you know, Robert Kiyosaki, right? I don't know what you think about him. Rich dad, poor dad. Yeah, but have, have you read any like the, um, the, um, like the, his cash flow book or anything like that? Yeah, yeah, I've read it. What do you think about it? Kiyosaki, I think he's got some good points. I think for, like, if you're a middle class person, I think real estate is your best shot at becoming an upper class person. Do you think, you think, you think like, um, like for example, like stock investment index funds, do you think that should be like a, like a, like a like a side thing you do on top of doing something else for investments. Cause I think every single person out there thinks as if like, all right, so I'll put my hands. I think people that do those type of, that's why I recommend those, like those like investments here on my channel, like for the average person that just wants to like, you know, do that. But most of the people that do yeah. do that, it's just like, you know, it's kind of like, like saying, all right, I don't really want to learn so much about investing. Like I just put my money here and let it grow like with the economy or whatever like that, or like with the companies or whatever, you know? I mean, why not have stocks and real estate? That's how. Yeah, exactly. It, that's what the people with the big money do. I mean, they got stocks, they got real estate, commodities, bonds, they got investments overseas. Like, I mean, the the quicker you get to that, I mean, honestly, I think real estate is good for people. Like, I mean, where do you, where do you live, Tommy? I live in New York. You live in New York, so yeah. I mean, the so New York metropolitan area is not that expensive for real estate, but Manhattan and the boroughs are very expensive. So, like, yeah. like you can get involved in real estate in New York, but it's, it's pretty difficult in the city. Yeah. Um, so like, I don't know, like it's, and cap rates are kind of low in New York. Um, the rates of investment return on real estate are kind of low because a lot of foreign money goes into New York. Um, but if you were say in Texas, like I am, like real estate's a really good option. Uh, you, you got this, basically what's happening in the U S is you have wealth moving from New York and California. To Texas and Florida and this is happening because of tax rates it's happening because of politics um, basically the economies in, in the richest parts of the country are not going to grow as fast as the poorer parts of the country and yeah I mean, so like, that, I mean that's like anything Texas, though. Like, that's like that's like almost anything like you like well, for example you have a big big company the the rate of, of growth that they can actually experience compared to like some like a like a like a like a poor like company or whatever it's like it's insane you know yeah I mean, in New York's case, they're they're kind of shooting themselves in the foot with some of their economic policy. Like they're they're literally driving capital away. It's going to Florida. It's going to Texas, and it, it'll take it'll take them fifteen years to figure this out. I mean, thirty years ago, Texas was not. I mean, North Texas in particular, it was not a wealthy place. Uh, I mean, most of the money came from oil in Texas. But what they did was is they made smart policies to encourage growth, and yeah. over time. I mean, Texas just, it's getting wealthier and wealthier. And New York is not, it's not experiencing that same level of growth. Yeah. 15 years from now, I mean, you see this. I mean, we'll, we'll see the census in 2020. We'll see how many people migrated to Texas um, from other states. I, I bet, I bet New York turns in a population decline. And to be honest, Manhattan's always going to be fine. Like, Manhattan yeah, yeah. is going to be a very, very wealthy place. But a lot of the policies that are happening in New York, it's it's harder to build wealth in New York. Like like you being in New York, it's it's harder to save. It's harder to. I mean, rents more expensive. Taxes are higher. Down here in Texas, like it's it's you can achieve your financial goals quicker. The exception would be is that there's a lot of capital in New York. So if you're in an industry like finance or technology, you're set. But for the average person, life's harder in New York. That that that's my opinion. Um, I'm sure. I, I, I mean, I, I, I know people feel differently about this, but for, 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 for people in the 50000 to $150,000 income bracket, Texas is the place. Um, it's, it's a big difference in what you take home. And I guess to like, kind of like close everything out, like what's like, um, what's your, what's your, um, like advice to anyone that's like trying to like, um, like, you know, become an investor 
or like trying to like build wealth or anything like that like from your personal experience like what do you do to like kind of to like kind of like, like you know like like make sure like you're gonna be like financially secure or anything like that just show up like invest <laughs> you, know, you know how many people don't even show up like it's, it's like it, it, it it's absolutely insane i mean people say stock returns are low or real estate's not that great but i mean cash people like that's that's the most common investment is cash i mean people they don't invest at all they take no risk and as a result they don't grow their capital so i would say even you're you're better off getting screwed on robin hood and learning than to just sit in cash what what would make you even better off is to use vanguard index funds i mean for 95 percent of people i mean Hey, you're pretty smart. Like, like we're talking earlier about how you have an investment process and how you and how you're able to pick stocks and stuff. Most people, honestly, in, in the financial I mean, I I, you, I used to do I used to do that, and then I figured out like I don't I don't want to be an active investor. I rather just like put my money in an index fund, like let that do that that side of the money. But I'm gonna use the majority of my capital to actually build more wealth at a higher return. Yeah, and if you start that process. It's like a good habit. It's your wealth grows and grows and grows. If you make bad decisions wealth wise, then your wealth shrinks. That's just that, that's just how it works. So like you, I mean, after fifteen to twenty years of making these decisions, all, all of a sudden you end up in a really good spot compared to people who made different decisions. I mean, you choose to invest. You choose to you choose to not chain smoke cigarettes. You choose yeah. to not drink every night. You know, it's it makes a difference, and uh, people have a tendency to be really cynical. Um, but if if you invest in your long stocks, if you own stocks, you own real estate. Like your wealth should increase over time, and yeah. and if it doesn't, everybody else is in the same boat as you anyway. So don't worry about it. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, thanks for the conversation, Logan. It's like you've been like a like like a charm. Awesome. Yep. Was was I helpful? Yeah, you were super helpful, man. Like you, like you, you're saying so many things that like, like I, I wasn't even thinking about. Like your entire perspective on on like on Robin Hood, your entire perspective on the market, your entire perspective on the average person. Like it's great, it's awesome. Like you were very grateful. And I'm gonna plug like all your Instagram information like in the description down below, all your articles in the description down below. Everything's gonna be there. Hopefully, you get some traction from this. You know, I got, you know, I got a book out, Tommy, on 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 finance. Yeah. No way. Yeah, it's it's actually pretty good for beginning investors. The articles are more advanced, but the book is it's pretty good. It's called High Finance. So guys, you heard it. Logan has a book out, has articles, and is also this financial guru. It's awesome, man. Thank you so much for coming on. And yeah, if you can, if you want to come on at any time, any moment, with any more stuff you want to talk about, a hundred percent in. All right, thanks, Tommy. Appreciate it. See you later, man. All right, so that interview was very, very long, right? But for me, it felt like literally five minutes of talking with Logan. And the reason is because he has so much more information than I could possibly believe, right? I learned so much just from a 30-minute conversation from this expert guy that I didn't know before, okay? A lot of the things that he said, I had an entire perspective to it, guys. You guys know I'm really big on education, but when he fundamentally told me, Tommy, that's a great thing, but, you know, fundamentally, there's a whole bunch of things we also need to fix, but that's a good start, you know? And it's a whole bunch of good conversations, a whole bunch of other things, and listen to this, guys, right? I didn't know prior to this interview that he actually had a book written, which is very great, so I'm actually going to be reviewing that book. Let me know in the comments down below if I should review his book, okay? And guys, thank you for watching. If you guys want to read the book before I actually review it, just go ahead in the comments in the description down below. Just click it and buy it and show some love to Logan, guys. I'll see you guys next time on the next video. Thanks for watching. My name is Tanya Bryce. If you don't know me, you know me now. If you want more videos like this, right, when I bring on experts to the show and actually talk about things, let me know in the comments down below. And if you yourself want to come on the show and actually talk about something, let me know and I'll make it happen also. I'll see you guys next time on the next video and peace. You've got to start.